Hey friend, welcome to the Self-Care Isn't Selfish podcast. I'm your host, Emily Nichols. As a Whole30 certified coach, wife, busy working boy mom, and your self-care guru, I'm here to help you start putting yourself first without the guilt. Each week you'll hear motivating and practical tips on how you can create a habit of self-care through interviews with my amazing guests or quick solo episodes with me. After each episode, you'll walk away with an action plan and feel empowered to implement what you have learned into your life. So grab a cup of coffee, glass of wine, or your favorite sparkling water, and let's do this. You're listening to episode 68 of the Self-Care Isn't Selfish podcast. Hey, it's the start of a new week and the start of a new month. Let's talk about a new month. Doesn't that feel good to have a new month within your calendar, new ways to set goals for yourself and new opportunities to really think about how you want to think about yourself and your life. Okay, a big opportunity to make and create new habits to shift your mindset. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We are going to talk about how to actually use some proven tools to eliminate the self-limiting beliefs you feel about yourself. Now, friend, I just don't want you to listen to this episode and think, yeah, I should really do this. No. I want you to take action. So every Thursday after the episode airs in my free Facebook community, there's a link in the show notes, you can join me for a free workshop where we will be taking action on this week's topic, which is how to eliminate self-limiting beliefs. And guess what? You can even go back through the units within the the Facebook group and be able to see the past workshops that I've hosted. So you are able to take action in regards to your self-care. None of this matters unless you actually just do the darn thing, right? Right. So let me introduce to you our guest for today. Today I have Dr. Elizabeth Fedrick, or Liz, as she so kindly let me call her today during our episode. She's a licensed professional counselor and owns a private practice called Evolve Counseling out of Gilbert, Arizona. Liz and I connected online and it's just a beautiful thing when you find um, similar minded people that have really similar goals and the messaging that they're putting out there. And I'm so glad that we were able to have this conversation together and for you to hear it as well. So Liz has been providing counseling services for adults, children, and families for close to 10 years. And she's trained in various therapeutic modalities, and she really specializes in working in areas such as depression, anxiety, trauma, relationship issues, and personal improvement. And in addition to providing therapeutic services, Liz teaches psychology courses for Grand Canyon University. So she is the professional. She's smart, obviously. She knows what she is talking about. And I'm so excited for you to listen to this episode because Liz provides us some actual tangible tools to help you eliminate self-limiting beliefs. Is this something that's going to happen overnight? No. Probably not. It's something that we all struggle with at various points in our lives. But with the tools that Liz and I discussed today and how we'll be following up with this Thursday in my Facebook community, you will be able to start taking some action and have some things in your tool belt to help you just start being a little nicer to yourself. We could all do that, right? Exactly. And that is a huge form of self-care. So let's get into today's episode with Dr. Liz Fedrick. All right, gang, thanks so much again for tuning in to Self Care Isn't Selfish. I'm here with Dr. Liz Fedrick. We are going to be talking all about self-limiting beliefs today. Liz, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Like we were saying earlier, with all our Instagram interactions and everything, it's so nice to be able to connect. Yes, yes. Oh, that's kind of the beauty of social media, sometimes connecting with people you would never meet and just learning from each other. I love that. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, Liz, let's get this conversation going. The first question I ask all my guests is, what does self-care mean to you? So, Liz, what does self-care mean to you? That is such a good question. It is so unique um, for really everyone. And um, self-care 
for me is really it comes down to balance and it comes down to making time um, to do things that I enjoy. Um, the self-care aspects of it in terms of um, exercise and nutrition and sleep and all of those, I, I that to me is also self-care and is crucial. But that stuff is kind of built in to um, my expectations of functioning and so really the the self-care like that that doesn't feel like care it just feels like that is routine and so really when it comes to self-care it's about taking time for me to do things that I enjoy and things that are uh not necessarily what I would define as productive gotcha <laughs> expectations of functioning I love that <laughs> that's a great way to put self-care as well and you're right it's so unique to every individual that's for sure yes. Awesome. Yes, it is. Well, Liz, go ahead and tell everyone a little bit about yourself, kind of what's your story and what you're doing now. Sure. Um, so I've been uh, doing therapy for about 10 years or so now. Um, I started in community mental health. And so I was working, uh, I, I got into the counseling field. I, I have a passion for adolescent females. And that is what really drove me into the field. And that is what I had planned to be working, uh, who I had planned to be working with throughout my career. It has changed vastly since the beginning of doing um, community mental health, doing a lot of in-home services with foster children and uh, reunification processes and stuff like that. Um, and then about three or four years ago, I transitioned into private practice. Um, and so then that was a whole different demographic, a whole different experience oh, oh, yeah, <laughs> for yeah. sure. And then uh, last year, last June, I, I opened my own practice. And so that is currently uh, my own practice in Gilbert, Arizona. And um, I have five other providers who work with me here at the practice. Um, and I work mostly with um, adults now doing a lot of individual work. Um, I specialize in relationship work, whether working with the individual or with couples or with families. Um, and so that's really where my passion is. Um, as you mentioned earlier, the limiting beliefs that we're going to be talking about, uh, that is truly the foundation of my practice is identifying what are those negative core beliefs um, and how they're impacting us and what we can do to change them so that we can really change the trajectory of daily functioning. Sure, sure. Well, and like you said, it's such a core factor in so many different people's lives. And it not only affects, affects you, but it can affect, uh, affect those around you as well. Mm-hmm. You know, you kind of impose those self-limiting beliefs on others as well. You know, let's kind of get into this a little bit. I mean, as far as when someone has a self-limiting belief, how can that actually limit some of the things they are wanting to do in life or accomplish for that matter? That's a great question. You know, we've all heard the little cliche quote of whether you believe you can or you can't, you're right. Right. And that is truly, um, that is truly the case. And so when we're talking about belief systems and the development of them, they develop in early, um, they develop really start developing in infancy. Um, And it's these interactions with our primary caregivers. And so when how depending on how responsive our primary caregivers are how loving how nurturing um whether our needs are um an inconvenience to them all of those things start to start start to create the foundation of these belief systems that we then carry with us into adulthood and so if we're operating through life uh on a belief that uh we're an inconvenience or our needs don't matter we're taking care of ourselves is selfish and inappropriate and all of those things, our behaviors will be a reflection of those beliefs. That's so interesting. It can start that early in life. I never knew that. Yes. Yeah. And it it really does because it's through our interactions with others, it's through our interactions, uh, our life experiences that the beliefs are formed. um, And then it's, they're reaffirmed. And so we have all of these experiences that we're not really paying attention to, but when you think of the term like confirmation bias, you know, we seek out information to confirm beliefs that we already have. So uh, this is often, it's a psychological term, it's often applied to religion and politics and beliefs like that, but it's very applicable to our, our personal belief system as well, because if we believe something about ourselves, we often seek out further information to reaffirm it. Interesting. So how do you flip that script in your head, though, if that's something just so buried internally in you? How do you reverse that if it's limiting some opportunities within your life? 
Yeah, so how you had said that we project those beliefs, that is so true. And so one of the first ways of being aware of our belief systems and working to shift them is being aware of the ones that were actually projected onto us. Mm. And so when somebody is saying, I'm not smart enough, I'm not, I'm not uh, good enough, I'm not all of these things, it's asking whose voice is that? Like, where does that come from? Who, who did you learn that from? And whether that's directly or indirectly, because that could truly be a, a parent or a partner or a friend, that could be something that people are saying, but it can also be something that was observed in childhood. And so if the child is watching their mother walk around with the beliefs of the mother's not good enough. And so we're seeing that through all the behaviors of, you know, the mother not engaging in her own self-care, not, you know, putting everyone else first, not taking care of herself. The child sees this as this is a, um, this is how we should behave. And so maybe the mom never says to the child, you're not good enough, but the child watching those behaviors, they start to take that on for themselves. Gotcha. Gotcha. So say I was thinking I'm not smart enough to do so-and-so or accomplish this. How would I overcome that self-limiting belief? So one of the approaches that I use pretty early on in sessions, um, I talk about this approach all the time because I, I think it's the most effective and um, I have seen it really work wonders. And so how we, what we first do is we start with, um, so I, I draw an image of a, like a Pac-Man looking image on a piece of paper, okay? And it has a triangle mouth. And so um, we talk about that being their core belief. And so their negative core belief. So maybe as you're saying, I'm not smart enough, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we talk about all of these different um, triangles that are reaffirming. So our triangles meaning these life experiences that reaffirm that. So maybe getting a bad uh, score on a test, maybe um, forgetting even a grocery item at the grocery store or not being able to help your kid with homework. Whatever the case, that these are the triangles reaffirming it. But the other aspect of this is that we also have these things surrounding us that we call our rectangles, okay? And so these are what we call evidence to the contrary. So these are the times when we were able to effectively help our child with their homework, or we did a really well on a presentation at work, or our boss told us, wow, that was such good information you came up with, okay? All of these are our rectangles and they're evidence that do not support our belief system. Because when you think of the Pac-Man's mouth and when you think of the triangle mouth and the, the shape of the rectangles, you can imagine what's going on there, right? Yeah. Like the, all the other triangles feed in and reaffirm it, but the rectangles just bounce right out. Mm. And so when you're asking what can we do to start to shift this belief, we have to start paying attention to the rectangles. We have to start paying attention to the evidence that does not support the negative belief and we create, so um, I provide my clients with something called an evidence log. And so at the end of the day, they're identifying their rectangle. So they're actually writing down. When we, when we are ending our day, we're sitting there thinking of all of the triangles, all the ways that we did not measure up, right? And so if we are to shift the mindset, shift it um, with reframing and start focusing on, okay, what did go well? This is not about like, Okay, just think positively and everything will be fine. Like that is not at all the idea, but rather what is the evidence to support a different belief? Oh, that is such a wonderful analogy. I hope everyone gets out a pen and paper and <laughs> draws a little back man and does yes. that. That's such a great analogy. Well, you know, and it makes me think, you know, early um, this spring, actually when COVID hit, I was studying to get um, my personal training certification. It was something I was really nervous about. Because in my mind, I had my own self-limiting belief that I'm bad at taking tests. I'm mm. not smart enough in regards to like anatomy. And this is really overwhelming. And then I, you know, just got into studying and figured out what worked for me. And I passed the test. And afterwards, I was like, I am smart. I, you know, can do hard yes. things. And like you said, that was evidence for me right there that I did something really hard. I figured out a way to make it work for me. And I think the more like you're having like an evidence log, that's so great. The more you're doing that, you're building up a habit and just pushing yes. away those limiting beliefs and showing what's true. Yes. And that's absolutely right. Because messing up is a part of life. Right. Messing up does not mean we're stupid, does not mean we're inadequate, does not mean 
so you're exactly right. Tracking the ways in which we are all of those things um, can really start to shift the mindset. And, and that's a great example that you're giving about taking that test because to your earlier question of how can these limiting beliefs impact our daily functioning, there's a good chance that you would have been like, forget that. I'm not going to pursue that dream. I can't oh, do that. Oh, I've been delaying it for about like two years because like, yes. that's really intimidating. That's really scary for me. Right. And that's, that is exactly it. As opposed to when you finally decided like, mm. I can do hard things. I just got to figure it out. And you did it. Hey gang, cutting in on this conversation real quick to tell you about my friends at The New Primal. I love this company not only because they make Whole30 approved sauces and meat sticks with just clean ingredients, but because of their mission of returning to the table. You know, food really does bring people together and with all of our busy lives, it's hard to sit down to a meal together with your own family and your other loved ones. But the new Primal is really focused on community and bringing people together around food. And why not do that with clean ingredients? I use their classic marinade weekly. Their mustard barbecue is the perfect dipping sauce and their ketchup as well. My kids love all their different spicy buffalo sauces as well. And like I said, their meat sticks are Whole30 approved, so I always have some in my handbag or in my glove compartment in my car if I need a quick emergency snack. So head over to thenewprimal.com and you can use the code EMILYNICHOLS22 to receive 15% off your order. So remember, go to newprimal.com and let us know how you are returning to the table and connecting with others through food and the new primal. Right. Right. I followed the work of um, Dr. Byron Katie. She has a system called, is it true? And like when you're having a thought about yourself or even someone else, you think to you say out loud, like, is this true? And looking for evidence that actually backs it up. And most of the time it's like, I don't have any really con good concrete evidence to say this is true. And it's just really flipping that script in your head. That's exactly right. And that's, we talk a lot about in session about that mm -hmm. feelings are not facts. And so just because you feel a certain way, just mm -hmm. because you feel like you're not good enough, that doesn't make it a fact. It's right. just how you're feeling. Oh my gosh. This is so good. So let me ask you this. I'm, I'm exploring body confidence a little bit more on the show in the next coming months because I talked about in my one-year anniversary episode, I noticed it's something I haven't talked about a lot in the past year on the podcast because it's something I personally struggle with. And I think it's just coming from a diet culture mentality and growing up in the era that I mm -hmm. did um, and just being a female too right. as well. So how would, what advice would you give to someone who is struggling with their body confidence. And, you know, I'm someone who's very active. My self-care routine is sacred to me. I move my body and still I'll look in the mirror and just not feel a hundred percent confident in myself. How would mm -hmm. you advise someone to try to move past that self-limiting belief or just forgive themselves for feeling that way sometimes? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that beautifully said with just forgiving yourself sometimes, yeah. because to a certain extent, that is how we're wired and we are critical and we're self-critical. And so there are times when that focus is um, going to be on what we don't like and what we're not proud of. And so having, giving yourself that space and grace to be human, that that is part of being human and that's okay. But knowing that we don't want to spend most of our time there. And so if we catch ourselves doing that, then we can give ourselves grace for that, but then we want to shift out of that. And there's a couple different ways um, that that can happen. And, and one of them is when I'm working with um, individuals on body confidence or on, you know, maybe even disordered eating, those type of things. One of the things we start to focus on right away is what are some of the things that are important to you and that you're passionate outside of your body, outside of losing weight, outside of you, what are the, what are the other things that you're proud of and that are important to you? And so really working to shift the focus in general, um, that yes, I can acknowledge that, that their body image is really important to them, but that does not define them. That is not who they are. 
And so we had to start shifting that mindset, right? So who are you? What is your identity? Let's explore all of these other wonderful things about you. Um, so that would be one of the approaches. Is that something you have tried or something you have talked about? No, but I need to. <laughs> I'm sitting here like, yes. When I'm looking in the mirror yeah. being like, oh, these jeans fit a little tight. Be like, okay, I'm not defined by like how tight these jeans are right. on me right when, now. That's so When you yeah. think about the whole rest of your week and you think about all the amazing things you did and you think about all the, you know, beautiful relationships and, all, yeah. and it's like, okay, that just, that is not my identity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, Oh gosh, I love that. Well, and you know, no matter how tight your jeans are, that's not going to define the rest of your week and the successes you're going to have. And, right. you know, I say this to people all the time, like, it's okay to feel something a certain sometimes, but you just can't get stuck there. And I think that's where some people have a pitfall. They just dig themselves into a deep, dark hole that they can't get out of. And then they find themselves in social situations being like, can people notice, you know, I'm wearing Spanx under this and doing that. And it can really have a snowball effect in the wrong direction. That's exactly right. And that would be one of the other approaches is like you're saying, it's not get, it's not allowing yourself to get stuck in it. And so there has to be um, what we would call reframing. And so when we're having all of these really negative thoughts about ourselves, we identify those as cognitive distortions. And so these are ways that we're thinking about ourselves that is maybe not accurate, that's completely negative. And even that's a great example that you give of, does everyone else notice? And the reality is nobody notices. Yeah. <laughs> this is all, this is all your belief system going on. And so this is where reframing comes in. And so when you're standing in the mirror and you're picking apart everything you don't like, A, stop. Okay. Cause that is completely unproductive. And so walk away from that. And that is something I've worked with clients um, whether it's that they need to set an, a timer, an alarm, maybe they have a certain time of day that they get ready in the morning and they catch themselves standing there for like an extra 10 minutes picking themselves apart. Set an alarm when you know that that is going to start to kick in and that that external cue of, okay, nope, I'm not getting caught up in this um, can be really helpful. Um, but then the other part is, is the reframing aspect of it. So, okay, maybe I don't love what I see, but I love what my body can do for me. I love that how physical I can be. I love, um, you know, really looking at it from that different angle of what those things about it that you do appreciate and like about it. Sure. Well, even going back to the evidence of what your body can yes. do, it can reframe it as well. And I love that cueing too. I love to have a cue like that with a lot of different things in life. That makes a big difference. It really, it really does because we can get so absorbed in our thoughts and takes us to a whole other world. And mm -hmm. so having ways to bring ourselves back out of that, um, is really effective. Yeah. Like you said, sometimes our emotions aren't necessarily the facts for sure. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. Well, and this is, I think a lot of people don't realize this is a really hard part about self-care. You know, it's not all just like bubble baths and massages and manicures, although there's nothing wrong with any of that whatsoever. Yeah, really. <laughs> but sometimes it's doing the hard internal reflection and having more compassion for yourself and self-love. So when you are doing your self-care routine, it is coming from a place of self-love and you know why you're doing it, not just to check it off a list because someone told you you need to have a self-care routine. But I think as women, we still struggle. Even people I interview on the show, sometimes they'll be like, well, you know, sometimes I take time for myself and I feel bad about it. And how can we overcome that feeling of selfishness when we're wanting to take time for ourselves, especially as women, working moms, it's so mm -hmm. easy to put everyone else first instead of yourself. So how can a woman overcome that feeling of guilt when it comes to taking care of themselves first? Yeah. So the, that ties directly back into core beliefs. Okay. And so even when we take it back to the body confidence, um, real quick, touching back on that, the core beliefs that are tied into that as well, that you know, when you're standing in the mirror, picking yourself apart, who, whose expectations are those? Like, did that come from Instagram? Did that come from TV? Like, because all of those interactions, it's not just our interactions with our parents that develop our belief systems. It's all of our life experiences that do. And so where are these, uh, expectations and these beliefs being influenced through? So this next part with, with that self-care 
feeling selfish and feeling guilty for it, that's an, also another really good opportunity to stop and reflect, where is that coming from? Who taught me that? Who taught mm -hmm. me that if I take care of myself, that selfish and for a lot of um a lot of women who feel that way there's at times a lot of codependency behaviors going on and i i talk a lot about codependency in the work that i do or in the podcasts that i do as well because it's so relevant and it ties in with the belief system and i like to really clarify that Codependency is often looked at as um, this individual maybe this like weak or needy individual who's really dependent on everyone else but in fact, the codependent individual is the one taking care of everyone else, okay? So they are the one that are, um, they're always putting their needs last. Um, they're the people pleasers, they're perfectionists, the um, overachievers. Um, and when we look at it from that angle, we can, we can start to ask, where did these behaviors come from? For a lot of people, it develops in childhood. So was it your responsibility to care for your parents or your siblings emotions um, if the house was chaotic what was your role in that was that was your role to step in and take care of people to um, try to get it to stop you know like so we reflect back on what was your role in childhood and so how is that impacting you today um, because if you grew up with a belief that it's your job like literally it's your job to take care of everyone because that's what you did in your family dynamic then into adulthood the belief is going to be the same Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it gets, it can get really, um, it can, what, what, complex, I guess would be a good yeah. word. Yeah. Well, because, I think, yeah, people probably don't really reflect too much on, you know, what kind of house did I grow up in? What was the way that my parents thought that maybe I think about now? And sometimes I don't think people reflect on that and think about, well, maybe I don't want to feel this way and I need, I can change that and feel empowered yeah. to change that, that you don't have to stay there. Right. Because maybe it wasn't, maybe that's not even your belief. Maybe that belief was adapted because your mom took care of everyone or your dad took care of everyone or whoever you were raised by. And so now in adulthood, when we feel this guilt and we feel the um, selfishness for wanting to take care of ourselves, the first place to start is, okay, where is that coming from? Mm -hmm. And when we can start to sort through that, that's really helpful. But then also shifting, so using like the evidence log to shift, um, that in fact, me taking care of my body is not selfish because if I'm sick, then I can't take care of anyone else's right. and so on and so forth. Gosh, so many great tools you brought to the show today, Liz, for sure. And just a lot of, you know, a lot of self-reflecting that I don't think we take a lot of time to do, which I think is super duper important when it comes to thinking about how you want to feel your best. I absolutely agree because these... The way we feel about ourselves today is usually the result of something else. And that the biggest thing that I like to, you know, in sessions is give that hope that um, these beliefs didn't come from nowhere and we can work to, to rewire them. We can work to change them. And then ultimately that can change how you feel about yourself and others in the world as a whole. And so really boiling down to giving hope that, um, the way that you're feeling today doesn't have to be the way that you feel forever. Absolutely. Oh, I love that hopeful feeling for sure. <laughs> and you're giving that to people as well. That's yes. empowering them. So, well, Liz, where can everyone connect with you online and follow along for more great tools and strategies and reflections? Yes. So my website is evolvecounselingaz.com. Um, and then I'm also on Instagram and I uh, interact a lot with people through DMs and through posts and stuff like that on Instagram at evolvecounselingaz. Um, and I usually provide, I do my best to provide some of these uh, reflective opportunities in my posts. Yeah, this is such wonderful information. I know it's going to be super useful for everyone. So I'll make sure to include links in the show notes so everyone can connect with you over there. But Liz, thank you so much Perfect. for coming on the show. You, I feel like you helped me as well today. <laughs> so I'm going to start queuing and doing some own reflections and maybe keeping that evidence log. I love that. Yes, I'll email over to you. You can put in the show notes. I'll email over to you um, the image of the Pac-Man as well as the evidence log. And so if oh, gosh, listeners want to access that, they can. Oh, that's great. Liz, thank you so much again. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. I really appreciate it as well.
Thank you, Dr. Liz, for this wonderful conversation and all of the tools you left for the audience today on how to eliminate self-limiting beliefs. Like I said, I feel like I learned a lot today about myself and some new tools that I can use as well when I'm not speaking so nice to myself. So gang, as always, here's my three biggest takeaways. And in all reality, it was really hard to break it down to just three because there were so many nuggets of wisdom. But let's go over this. So number one, reflection. Like Liz mentioned, you need to learn about your feelings and reflect on if this is something that was projected on you from a young age, either directly or indirectly, okay? Whether it be through your family, how you were raised, friends, who you surrounded yourself with, who, you know, what was around you media-wise at that time indirectly or just what you heard as far as expectations as a woman, for example, But really reflect on where those feelings you have about yourself are coming from. Really dig back deep into your life and think of where these things are coming from and understand that you now could be projecting those same feelings onto someone else, okay? Whether they be negative or positive, you can project your feelings onto other people. So I think it's really important to sit back and reflect and really think about where those feelings are coming from, how they were projected onto you, and how perhaps now you might be projecting those same feelings onto others. So number two, this leads me into my second biggest takeaway. How much did you love Liz's Pac-Man reference? Oh my gosh, I love a good analogy and an image like that. And that's what we'll be using this Thursday in my free Facebook community. Again, there's a link in the pro and the show notes if you want to join us. But we're going to be talking about <laughs> those those little triangles we're eating, which are those negative core beliefs. That's what we're eating. That's what we're putting in our mouths. And we really need to focus on those rectangles, Liz had said. The evidence to the contrary really pay more attention to those. And you can do that through the evidence log that Liz had mentioned as well. So I love that analogy and really not focusing on your negative core beliefs, but looking to evidence to the contrary. You know, messing up is just part of life. We are all going to screw up at some point in our life, but that doesn't have to be the way it was way it is for you forever. Like I mentioned, going through my personal training certification, I have always considered myself a bad test taker. I am not good at studying. I am not smart enough to understand anatomy. But as I dug into the studying and really got rid of, you know, those self-limiting beliefs and focusing on the evidence, like, hey, I've done some really amazing things and hard things in my life. And I'm a lot smarter than what I give myself credit for. You know, I'm always like, you know, I'm street star- smart, not book smart. <laughs> you know, I'm not on the streets. That's weird. But you know what I mean. But I really went through that own own example, as I mentioned in the show, because it's something I've always truly believed in myself. I'm not book smart enough to do something like that. And I did it. And now it's had a ripple effect in other areas of my life, as I mentioned back in some of my previous episodes on how you can do hard things as well. And then number three, reframing the way you think and cueing yourself. So like Liz mentioned, your feelings are not facts, right? They are not the facts. That's why we're going to use the evidence log in this week's workshop on Thursday um, in our group. But going back to body positivity, like I said, this is something I'm trying to focus on more for myself and sharing more here on the show as well. But thinking about when you're looking in the mirror, cueing yourself instead of being a negative person at yourself, oh, my jeans are tighter, automatically think of three things you could say about yourself that you love about yourself instead of already focusing on the physical or what's what's outside of your body. All of that doesn't define you. And really, what type of expectation are you putting on yourself? And why are we picking ourselves apart? How are you being influenced? What are you 
you know, seen every day, especially on social media. If there is, some, this is another way you could reframe or set up a cue for yourself. If you are on social media and you follow a friend who, you know, she's a great friend, but everything she posts is really triggering to you and your own body confidence. You found yourself comparing yourself to her or feeling more negative about yourself unfollow her or silence her or hide her or whatever you can do on Instagram so you don't feel like you're going to hurt your friend's feelings. That's another way to reframe or cue something in your life that is triggering you to feel a certain way. Okay? So like I mentioned, this Thursday in our workshop, we'll be doing that little Pac-Man exercise and evidence log together because I think that is so useful and something I know I'm personally going to be using moving forward and eliminating self-limiting beliefs that I feel about myself. But I'm going to leave you with this because this is something so amazing that Liz said that I want you to really um, focus on moving forward, meditate on it, pray about it. So the way you feel today doesn't have to be the way you feel forever. I say this all the time. It's okay to be in your feelings, to be upset, to feel a certain way. You know, we've talked about toxic positivity and now that, you know, always focusing on the good and, you know, not not feeling your feelings is actually um, not so great for you. Feel your feelings, but just don't get stuck there. Just don't get stuck there. If I looked in the mirror every single day and was like, eh, well, I'm feeling a little bloated today. My pants are a little tighter. If I did that every single day and I felt like that every single day, that's going to have a ripple effect in other areas of my life. And I'm not going to feel so great. And I'm going to project that onto others. Yeah. So take that with a grain of salt. Like I said at the beginning of the episode, I want you to have an open mind and an open heart and really, really think about how you can take action based on these tools that Liz provided for us today to eliminate self-limiting beliefs. So Liz, thank you again for coming on the show, for including so many great tools. I know this is going to be so useful for my audience. Gang, if you loved today's episode, make sure to leave a rating and review. Let me know what your biggest takeaways were. Tag Liz as well. I'll include some links to her resources in the show notes for you as well. And give me a follow over on Instagram at emilynichols22 so we can see what's going on over there behind the scenes and a lot of extra goodies, of course, happening in my free Facebook community. And again, it's, since it is the start of a new month, I am still offering a virtual group fitness. It's $5 a class now. I would love for you to join me. The schedule is linked in the show notes as well. As you know, I truly believe moving your body is one of the highest forms of self-care and has a big snowball effect on your life. So join me over there as well. So gang, I am here for you, sending you lots of love. Let's connect over on Instagram so we can have some fun over there. And you might be able to see some (laughs) fun pictures from this past weekend for Halloween to see what my husband and I were um, dressed up as. You're going to die. It's so funny. (laughs) All right, gang, let's eliminate those self-limiting beliefs going into the week, feeling good about ourselves. I'll see you Thursday in my free Facebook community so we can start taking action together. And as always, remember, self-care isn't selfish. Bye. Bye.